Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath services. Well, while the world is fulfilling Matthew 24, how about the phrases that say, you shall hear of wars and rumors of war? What's going on right now? Okay. And false prophets. Now, what's the next thing to come with the false prophets? And false Christ. Great signs and wonders. So how are you going to know who is who? Huh? Anybody think of a scripture? Isaiah 8. To the law and the testimony, that's the Old Testament and the New Testament, if they don't speak according to this word, there is no light in them. Okay? Now, I want to show you what's happening in Bible translation, so I want you to turn to 1 John, the third chapter. And this is in the New Revised Standard Version. Okay? Now, what you're going to find is this. The more time that you spend with a faithful version, the more you're going to understand that that's exactly what it is. Okay? So everybody out there, 1 John Three. Now, why? Okay. Look at the world today. There are liars everywhere, right? And now they're coming out in the open, and they don't care if they're caught in the lies because there are so many of them, they'll be protected, right? Okay. So that's exactly what they've done on translating committees. Let's read it here, because I've been talking with a man who insists he doesn't sin. I've been born again, and I can't sin. And I've sent him a lot of emails and tell him, well, read this, read that, read the other thing. And I've had this new revised standard given to me as a sample for, by Jennifer Riemshauser, who works for the printing company that did the book, Second Edition, God's Plan for Mankind. Okay. Now, they did pretty good on verse 4. Okay. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now, that's a correct translation there. And you know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin, and no one who abides in him sins. Aha. See, the word is practice. See? No one who sins has either seen him or knows him. So you see, people read that and they think, well, I know the Lord. I don't sin. Okay? I go to church every Sunday, and boy, you ought to come to our Christmas parties. Okay? Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right. Huh. Faithful version reads righteousness. Everyone who does what is right is righteous. Huh. What proverb talks about what seems right to a man? Woman. Proverb 14, 12. And 16, 25. There is a way which seems right to a man. The ends thereof are the ways of death. All right? Everyone who does what is right is righteous. 
Therefore, everyone doing what is ever right in their own eyes is righteous. Okay? Because Satan has gotten onto the translating committees to mess up the word of God. Now notice, just as he is righteous. Now they have this next part correct. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of Man was revealed for the purpose to destroy the works of the devil. That's correct. Next verse. Those who have been born of God do not sin. Okay. It should read, everyone who has been begotten by God does not practice sin. Okay? That's why the faithful version is the most reliable Bible you can get. Because it wasn't done by committee. Someone wrote me and asked me about committees. Committees always end up being political. Can't avoid it. Okay? And who loves to get on committees? Satan's agents. See? That's how the deep state has now taken over the government of America by having the civil workers stay on the jobs for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And most of those who are Democrats are dyed in the wool fascist communist. Okay? And, of course, they didn't show their colors until recently. So, likewise, with these translations. They translate certain verses correct, and then, boom, they mistranslate it. And people don't know it because they don't check it out. All right? Now, notice, it says, those. It should read, the one or he. It's not plural. Now, what is the big psychological thing you see on television today in almost every single ad? The group, together, we all do it. Here it is right here. Those who see, change a present tense singular participle into a plural participle. And you can't do that in the Greek. That's why God had the New Testament written in Greek, because it is precise. See? Those who have been born of God do not sin. Well, no one's been born of God, because born of God means you've been raised from the dead. Christ was what? The first born from the dead, right? Okay. Because God's seed abides in him. There it, it should read, the one who has been begotten by God cannot practice sin because his seed abides in him. See? Now you go, you go and, and study more in 1 John. It starts out right in the front. If we sin, he is righteous to forgive our sins. Was John according to the Protestants, 
born again? Yes. But he included himself, we, if we sin. And how long was he an apostle by the time he wrote that? Probably about 60 years. Okay. Then it says, they cannot sin. Wrong translation. Because they have been born of God. Begotten. See? If you're born, then the seed, okay? The seed is when you're begotten. And you are not born again until the resurrection, okay? Continuing, I'll finish this section here. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All, all who do not do what is right. Now, what is right? It should be singular, right? Okay. It should read, the one who practices righteousness is from God. Okay. Okay. The one who does not practice righteousness is not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. Amazing. Now, it's that way all through. All through. And what it's promoting is, who's to say what's right and wrong? And what it's promoting is groupthink. See? Only those in this room will be in the kingdom of God. Well, that's a ridiculous statement. See? Does God deal with us individually? Yes, he does. Okay, so you get new people coming along and they get terrible Bibles like this new revised standard. It'll be hard for them to understand the truth. And the Bible, see, tells us that the word of God is true, right? Word of God is faithful. Yes, the word of God is for conviction and instruction. That's all I'm going to say on it. I spent too much time on it anyway. Let's continue with the Bible answers. Answers to your questions, all right? Here is one about two witnesses. Do the two witnesses take those who go to a place of safety, to a place of safety, as Moses and Aaron took the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now, just because there are two witnesses, and you have what Moses and Aaron did, does not mean that you tie a similar action to the two witnesses. Because if you get our Daniel and Revelation series and look at that big main chart, you will see that the angels, Luke 17, take those to a place of safety before the two witnesses come on the scene. See? Now, the key thing to measure all those times is this. The Pentecost resurrection. So you look at the chart the last year. And by the way, that's a 13-month year. It's a leap year. Just like we have this year, we have a leap year. Okay? And you come to Pentecost, and then you count backwards, times, time, and a half a times, 1,260 days, 1,290 days, 1,335 days. 
Now, it appears that the 1335, which they all end at the resurrection, okay? That's a thing to understand. So if they all end at the resurrection, which is true, because all the righteous will be resurrected, then 1335 starts before anything else, right? Starts before 1290, 45 days, right? Okay. And then another 30 days before you come to 1260. So let's go back here and read it in Revelation 12. And the more you watch the news, the other night I thought, well, there's nothing on, so I will just channel surf. So I channel surf, channel surf. No, I don't have Hulu, and I don't have Netflix, and I don't have any of those other things. It just what is standard. And it is all a bunch of lies, make-believe, and garbage. And the cartoons for the children are satanic and stupid and played in such a way that it messes up the development of their minds because their minds cannot handle that that fast click 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 coop, choo, choo, choo. so do that go to a cartoon channel turn it on and turn down the sound and just watch all the all the herky jerky action okay and then watch the kids. That's the way they act. See? So that was an eye opener to me. Okay, here we are. Now, follows along as war in heaven, Satan and his angels are cast down. Okay. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast down to the earth, he persecuted the woman that brought forth the man-child. So it starts out exactly as Hitler did. What did he do to the Jews? Started persecuting them. Okay. And then it got worse. And then it got worse. Okay. So what's going to happen to Christians? Not all are going to a place of safety. God is going to have to make the choice. And Luke 17 tells us angels will take them to a place of safety. Okay. So this tells us the war in heaven probably occurs before 1335. Okay. Verse 14. And two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman. She might fly to her place in the wilderness where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a times. Okay? That's three and a half years, but that time can be longer in days counted by months. Okay? And the serpent cast water out of his mouth so that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood, but the earth helped the one, the earth opened its mouth, and swallowed up the river that the dragon had cast out of his mouth. Then the dragon was furious with the woman and went to make war. See, starts out what? Persecution. Now, war against the rest of her seed. Now, the King James makes a bad translation. It says, remnant doesn't mean that. It means others, the rest of her seed, not remnant, because the smaller number are going to a place of safety. The larger number are left behind. Now notice what they do, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right? So there is no connection between Moses and Aaron and the two witnesses. You can study more about the two witnesses, Zechariah 3 and Zechariah 4. All right. Okay. Here's one here. Book of Job, 
chapter 28. Let's go back there. Question is concerning the mining. Right here in verse 1. Okay. Surely there is a mine for the silver and a place where they refine gold. Now, they know that in land of Israel, here you have Mediterranean Sea, and then you have Sinai Peninsula, and between that you have this desert area, the wilderness, okay? And there they had gold mines, copper mines, and silver mines, and smelters, see? So when people think, you know, all oh, these people were awkward and uneducated, they knew how to do things, okay? So then it says, iron. Now, when was the book of Job written? Okay. We have a clue. What clue was that? Eliaphaz, the Temanite. Who was his father? Esau. So right at the time of Jacob and Esau, okay? So there was a good amount of knowledge. Iron is taken out of the earth, and bronze is melted out of the stone. Man puts an end to darkness, that is, going down into the mine. They had to have light in order to see. How many have gone to Carlsbad Caverns? No, no, you did. They take you there, and they say, all right, now, everybody, we're going to turn out the lights for just a minute. Don't be afraid, but we want you to put your hand in front of your face and want to know if you can see it. Boom! Lights go out. Black, you can't see a thing. Right? Well, that's how it is down in these mines, okay? Now, a little sidebar. They're discovering... How many have seen that picture of those in one of the Egyptian tombs? I think it was Tud Tudak Amun tomb, tomb, and they, they showed the hieroglyphic period pictures. And they had a man standing there with something that looked like a long light. And it had on the inside of it going like this. Have you seen that? Okay, we'll pay attention to it next time. Now, They've discovered that there's a cord running from the back of it over to a box. So, what would this box be? A battery. Because you look at those pictures and how finely they have been drawn, you're not going to do that with a flickering flame or a candle. See? Eh? Okay, so they get rid of darkness and in the shadow of death. He opens a shaft away from where men travel in places forgotten by man's feet. They hang and swing to and fro far away from men. Now, what is the question is, what is hanging to and fro? That's the way that they got the ore. They would have ropes, they would lodge them into the rocks, and then they would use them to swing so they could chip out the ore at the top of the mine. Continuing verse 5, As to the earth, out of it comes bread, but from beneath it is turned up like fire. That's a volcano. Right? Its stones are the place of sapphires, and it has dust of gold. There is a path which no bird knows, nor the vulture eye has seen. Okay? Now that means none of the birds of the air have ever been in a mine. That's what it means. Okay? Next question, I've got a whole pile of them. Question is, 
where God says, I dwell in thick darkness. So the question is, why would God dwell in thick darkness? The answer is, he doesn't. But men, when God is inside this closure, whatever it is, cloud or whatever covering he has, looks like a cloud that's really dark and black, but inside is God, and he's light. But viewing it, you see blackness. So he says, I dwell in thick darkness. See? Because if God is in the cloud, that's where he dwells, right? That doesn't mean he stays there. Okay? So that's, that's what that means. All right? Next question. And I'm glad you sent all these questions in. Uh, it's good to know what you're thinking. All right? Question. What is the difference between a Hebrew and a Jew? Okay. You know what it is? A Jew is a Hebrew, but a Hebrew is not a Jew. Why? All Hebrews come from Heber. Okay. Abraham was from Heber, but he wasn't a Jew. Now, Jews come from the tribe of Judah, so you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the 12 sons of Israel, correct? And one of the sons was called what? Judah, correct. The first time that those of Judah are called Jews is in 2 Kings 16.6. Okay. So the difference is that the Jews come from Israel and Israel comes from Jacob and Jacob comes from Isaac, and Isaac comes from Abraham, and Abraham comes from Heber. So read the genealogies in Genesis 10, and you will come to Heber, and he's the father of the Hebrews. Now, there are a lot of other nations that are Hebrews, but have nothing to do with Israel. All right, next question. Hebrews 12, 18. Let's go there. Hebrews 12, 18. You're getting the mountain mixed up. Okay. Hebrews 12, 18. Now, from where did God speak the Ten Commandments? What was the name of the mountain? Mount Sinai, right? Okay. All right. This is what he's talking about here. Verse 18, For you have not come to the mount that could be touched. They could touch it after God gave the Ten Commandments, but they couldn't come near it or go up on it while God was on the mountain. Okay. That could be touched and that burned with fire, nor to gloominess because they had the fire, the smoke, the dark clouds, just like it says God dwells in darkness. But inside the darkness, it's all bright nor to gloominess, fearful darkness, and the whirlwind, and to the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words which those who heard begged that the word not be spoken directly to them, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And even if an animal touches the mountain, it should be stoned or shot through with an arrow. 
And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am greatly afraid and trembling. Okay. Now the next verse is not Mount Zion on the earth, nor is it Mount Sinai. Mount Zion is in heaven. See? So, there are two different mountains. They're not the same, and that's why the word not is, isn't found in verse 22. But you have come to Mount Sion, that's in heaven above, and to the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Now that's something to think about when you pray. See? So Mount Zion is in heaven. Mount Zion is where the temple on the earth was, that was north of the city of David. So what you have in Jerusalem you have Fort Antonio, which was the Roman fortress. You have the temple just south of it, about 600 yards. Then you had David's hill, okay? And Mount Zion on the earth was where the temple was. Mount Zion is the one that's in heaven. Okay, I hope that answers your question. All right. Okay, question. Now, appreciate you asking the questions, but since we're not mind readers and God doesn't tell us, there are certain things we don't know. Uh, we can guess, but what's a guess worth? Maybe have some truth to it, maybe not have any truth to it. So the question is, do you think that God, who became Jesus Christ, while in the Garden of Eden, would have walked with Adam and Eve and spoke to them about their destiny as becoming gods? We have no idea. Okay? Now, we have just a clue. What did Satan say to Eve? if you eat of this. You shall be as God deciding good and evil. Doesn't mean you be like God. This was just in the decision making of what's right and wrong. Okay. So we don't know. All right. Next one. Does the kingdom of God work within us with the unseen Holy Spirit and Christ and God the Father? No, the kingdom of God does not. The kingdom of God is the realm of God. Who works inside of us is God the Father and Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we got a brand new booklet coming out written by Stephen Green and me. And we go through everything showing that the Bible proves that the Holy Spirit is the power of God, was not, has not been, cannot be the third person in a trinity, period. The Bible does not teach it, okay? And the last verse in Matthew 28, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, does not mean that they were following a trinity. See, all of that is done in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? In the name of the Father, because he's begetting you as a son or daughter. Okay? And of, not in the name, of Jesus Christ, because it was his sacrifice who forgave our sins. And the Holy Spirit doesn't say the name of Christ, the name of the Holy Spirit. It just, of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the purpose of being baptized is to what? Receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? So just a summary. 
I baptize you not into any sect or denomination of this world, but into the name of the Father because you are going to be his son, if it's a man, or daughter, if it's a woman. Okay? And of Jesus Christ because his sacrifice paid for your sins, and of the Holy Spirit because this is what the Father is going to put into your mind to unite with your spirit spirit of man, and we do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay? So some people say, well, we should just baptize in the name of Jesus. Well, doesn't tell us that. But we do. Everything set up here is done in the name of Jesus Christ and finishes off the prayer. So we baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, and the baptism is to carry out what God wants with this individual and his Holy Spirit. Okay? John 11, it seemed Caiaphas knew the destiny of Jesus. No, he did not know the destiny of Jesus. He prophesied of his death, John 11, because he was the high priest. In other words, God caused him to prophesy that Jesus would die. He knew nothing about Christ. Matter of fact, he was willing to kill him. And he said this because he was for killing him. Little did he know that that was the will of God for the forgiveness of sin. Okay? Next one. Will the animal sacrifices be reinstituted in the millennium? No. If Christ is here on the earth, which he will be, and all resurrected, resurrected saints are on the earth as being sons and daughters of God and priests and kings, you don't need sacrifices. Now then, for the feasts, there will probably be the burnt offerings for the festival. Okay? Do they eat food for the festival? Okay. Why would you need animal sacrifices when Christ is here? We don't need them today when he's not here. Okay? Okay? And where would all the sacrifices have to be given? Only where there was a temple of God, but there's not going to be a temple of God. There's going to be a tabernacle of God, Isaiah, the fourth chapter. A huge, big tabernacle. Okay? So no, there won't be sacrifices. Some of those other references that you read refer to their coming back after Babylon. They had sacrifices then. Okay? The second commandment forbids making idols. But God commanded them to make cherubims. Now, where were the cherubims? Hmm? Exodus 25. And also... There were woven into uh, some of the panels that they have cherubims. But were, where were they? Okay, that's the question. Now, the answer is 25 and verse 18. Okay, here we go. 25 and verse 18. And you shall make two carabin of, of gold of beaten work, and you shall make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. They were right over the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. How often were those seen? These two. Once a year. By whom? By the priest. He's the only one that went in there on the Day of Atonement, right? And it was pitch black in there, correct? No windows, no light, no candles, 
The only, only light he has had was the burning of the incense. Okay? So he never really saw them. Now later, they could be seen when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant out from the tabernacle. And you know what happened to them because they had the Ark. Okay? Now you talk about a plague where everyone is suffering the same thing. Think about it. Hemorrhoids. Everybody. And no preparation H. Okay. <laughs> and mice running wild everywhere. So they said, we need to get rid of them. We need to make an offering to send back. So they made a cart. They made some golden hemorrhoids and golden mice, put them in there, and they pointed the, the, the calf or the goat toward Israel and told it to go, and it took off. Okay? All right. So they didn't bow down and worship it. Philistines didn't. And when it was in the tabernacle, the priest didn't bow down and worship it. Okay. But what it was, it was a depiction of what was in heaven above. So that's all. If they would bow down and worship it, that would be a sin. Okay. But the workers who made it were instructed by God on how to make it. So it wasn't a figment of the imagination of their minds. Okay, let's see, is there one more here? Paul took a vow, which seems to be in opposition to Christ's admonition, don't make any vows. Okay. What was Paul doing? He was coming back to Jerusalem. All right. We know nothing of what his vow was. Didn't tell us. But if you're going to take a vow, as long as the temple stood, you could. So he shaved his head or whatever, whatever he did. Okay. And when he got up to Jerusalem, he doesn't tell us what he did. We have no idea. Okay. Now, for us... We're not to make any vows. Okay. And I think that's the only one that's recorded that Paul did, right? Wasn't it? Uh, was Priscilla and Quilla, did they have, did they take a vow and go up? I don't recall. Okay. So that takes care of that one. Let's go ahead and take a break and we'll be back in 20. Mm -hmm.